Hey everyone, what's up? This is Dr. Charlie Johnson, physical therapist. Hope you are doing well. And at the time of shooting this video, it is January 2nd, 2024. So happy new year. But regardless of where you are and when you watch this video, I want to share something really uh, powerful with you today, which is the nine lessons that I have learned from 2023 reviewing and working with uh, 1,352 back, butt, and sciatica pain cases. So uh, if you're new to my channel, my name is Dr. Charlie Johnson. I am a physical therapist and I have my orthopedic board specialty. I only help people with back, butt, and sciatic issues. So you could say it's a, an exclusive specialty of mine. And while I do not know everything, I will say that I have learned quite a few things. I wanted to take some time to just kind of recap the year and share with you um, all the things that I've learned. And this is really valuable for you. Again, if you have some type of back, butt, or sciatica problem, you're trying lots of different things and you wish you could have sort of a specialist summarize some of the big nuggets for you, some of the pitfalls and some of the things to sort of look out for so that you have the best chance of solving your problem naturally. So if you want to heal naturally, if you have some type of back, butt, sciatic issue, then stick around for this video and all nine lessons that I've learned after working with thousands of people, over 10,000 people now in my career with back, butt, and sciatica issues. Okay. So let's dive into it. Uh, by the way, if at any point you are interested as we go through this, you're like, hey, man, this dude loves this stuff. He's passionate about helping people. Um, and you're like looking for a natural way to uh, resolve your pain. You want to learn how to fix yourself without pill shot surgery. You can just click uh, somewhere in the description, check for a link uh, such that you can submit your case, a case review. It can be one of these, I don't know, 1,352 cases that we work with in the future. Um, and uh, I will review your case personally, and you can actually apply to work with us. We work with people all around the world, okay? So let's dive into it. First thing uh, that I learned in no specific order, by the way, are these nine things. But uh, first thing I took away from 2023 after working with thousands, again, of people with back, butt, sciatic issues is a mind over body, all right? So this is a really big takeaway for you. If you have some type of issue in this area of the body and you've been trying all kinds of physically-based treatments uh, and they're just not working, you have to understand the mind is intimately connected to the body. In fact, the body is the instrument of the mind, not the other way around. The body does what you tell it to do, what you tell it to do, all right? But most treatments, right, they're aimed at the physical body, and that's it. They complete disregard for the thing connected to it, right? The head sitting on top of your shoulders. X-rays, MRIs, what do they do? They take pictures of your body, right? Nobody's figured out how to take a picture of your mind yet. You can take a picture of the brain, right? But it's not really the mind. It's not all the inner workings going on. All right, so x-rays, MRIs, they look at the body. Injections, body, massage, knots, treating tension and fascial restrictions in the body. Back braces, right? They support the body. Chiropractic, we've got to realign, fix some subluxation. PT, decompression, EMGs, which are nerve tests, right? Uh, acupuncture, osteopathic, all aimed at fixing the very physical body. But again, these two things are sort of connected. All right. So dis-ease, and we'll talk more about this as we kind of go later into this um, presentation, if you will, but dis-ease within the mind can create disease or pain, numbness, tingling, funkiness in the body. All right. And then obviously vice versa. If you bend over, you pick something up, you might become anxious about picking things up. Right. So the other can also be true, but just realize that these things are connected. It's a two-way, two-way street here. Now, the interesting thing, and I've always known this, but I've just, it's just become more apparent and something that I wanted to kind of let y'all in on as I, um, you know, reflected upon the year of working with thousands of people with these issues, um, is that the mind can create any sensation in the body. In fact, it's sort of like the CEO. It can create feelings of numbness, tingling, burning, shooting, stabbing, achiness, tightness, weakness. What's interesting is that people have a way of sort of trying to segregate these things, right? If they feel stabbing, well, that can't be the mind. It's stabbing me and it's right here in my butt cheek. Or, you know what? The achiness could be the mind, right? But the numbness, Charlie, my feel feels numb. It's tingling. The mind can't do that. That's a physical thing. The, the mind, right, allows you to experience anything. The brain is the CEO, all right? And so any sensation or pain that you're experiencing could be created by the mind. So all sorts of yucky, weird, and funky feelings that feel very physical can actually be caused by danger signals or dis-ease within the mind. And this can mimic any structural diagnosis that you've been led to believe is the cause of your pain, right? Things like piriformis syndrome, a herniated disc, degenerative joint disease, degenerative disc disease, spinal stenosis, arthritis, bursitis, tendinitis, 
SI joint, I don't know why I put syndrome, SI joint uh, dysfunction, right? And or sciatica, just to name a few. Now, y'all have heard the term muscle memory. So let's talk about muscle memory in the way that I sort of think of it. Neurons that fire together, wire together. The more you practice something, the more you sort of groove that into the neural circuitry of your brain, right? If you sit there all day and you practice strumming some notes on your guitar, well, eventually, right, you're going to sort of do it. Um, it's going to be second nature. Have you ever driven somewhere, maybe driving to and from work every day? If you do that consistently and long enough, you don't even think about it. You just put on your tunes, you talk to people, and before you know it, you're at work or you're at home. It's your sort of on autopilot. The more you practice something, the more reps you put in, the more you can train your brain to do that thing. So you can learn to experience pain, just like you learn to drive from point A to point B or play any instrument or whatever. You can learn to experience pain and link it to physical activities, positions, and movement. If you believe that you can learn to play an instrument, you should be able to believe, right? Shouldn't be weird to you that you can learn to experience pain. So for example, if it hurts to sit, if you've had trouble sitting for you know, a month, two months, three months, six months, six years, the more you put on those reps, when I sit, it hurts. The more you reinforce, that is something that's dangerous to the mind, to the brain. Sitting equals bad. Sitting equals pain. Sitting equals numbness. What happens? Hey, body, uh, don't do that as much. You become avoidant of sitting. What do you do when you sit less than? You reinforce the sitting is even more dangerous. And before you know it, it hurts to sit. And you carry a cushion around with you everywhere you go. How do I know this? Because I work with people like you every day. <laughs> so pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience designed to protect you from some actual or perceived threat or danger. Actual, you may have bent over and hurt yourself, right? You may put your hand on a hot stove and when you touch it, right, your, your mind says, okay, don't do that. I'm going to make it hurt because there's an actual threat there. Or have you ever put your hand on the stove and you thought it was hot, right? And moved your hand quickly and you're like, oh, it's off. It was perceived threat or danger, but the response was the same, all right? So even after your body is healed from an injury, let's just say you hurt a disc and you heal within three months. But during those three months, you started to link sitting with pain or bending with pain or lifting with pain or the gym with pain. You can train your brain and your mind to experience fear or pain or some other dangerous signal associated with these activities. You can train your brain. You can learn to experience pain. So in this case, if this is the case, the pain fear loop actually just keeps your brain on high alert and trains your brain to become stuck in pain, in which case we've got to address it, right? And so again, we've got to treat both the mind and the body. And my beef with modern medicine, if you will, is that there's deep segregation and sort of a divide, if you will, in the way that we teach people how to solve these problems or the way that we approach solving these back butt side issues or really any pain experience for that matter. So all the traditional approaches, the PTs, the chiros, people like me, usually go more the body approach. And we can do that if you want, if you need to, right? We will absolutely do that and help you identify, is it mostly body or is it mind? But this is where everybody's focused. And notice how there is no head, the headless horseman. There is no head on this picture. The average medical doctor receives about nine hours of pain education in all of medical school. It's no wonder that they don't understand what pain really is and the way that the brain can influence the pain that we experience. And so they just ignore it. Ignorance, not knowing. Or we swing the other way. The pendulum goes the other way. We're just going to treat the mind. Notice there's no body here. It's just a head sitting on the side of the road, right? I'll go see the psychologist, a trauma therapist, a social worker, a counselor. I'll do cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, okay, but like there's a body connected to this thing. And it's so like when you want to get back to running and you want to be able to do that safely, how do you do that? Oh, just tell yourself you're fine. Well, what if you're deconditioned? What if you need to build up your strength? What if there's some physical component there? How do you connect the two? So rather than being about body or mind, right? It's mind and body. And that is what we aim to do for people all around the world who are stuck in pain, tired of working with people who see things only one way. If the only tool you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. And so we sort of take this hybrid approach where we studied all the physical side of things. Again, I'm a PT. I have an orthopedic board specialty. It's all I do. Worked with hip and spine surgeons. That's how, I, that's how I got so interested and saw the gap here. And then work also with psychologists. It's actually a minor of mine. Right? So how can we take the best of both the body and the mind so that 
when you go to solve this problem, we leave no stone unturned and give you the best chance of resolving your pain naturally. That is what we're all about. Okay. That is the first thing, mind over body. Again, the two are intimately connected. You cannot ignore one and or the other. You've got to treat them as a pair, as a unit, a system. All right. The second lesson and or nugget that I pulled from 2022, if I could sum it all up, 2023, is safety first. All right. What do I mean by this? So the most effective treatments focus on creating safety within the mind and the body. Safety is a key word here because most people think that treatment works because it fixes the structural body. I know I used to. Right? You've got to do these press-ups to push the jelly back in the donut, oriented in structure. Disc is causing me problem. I've got to fix that thing. I've got spinal stenosis, so we've got to open the central canal. We've got to increase the space where the nerves travel so the nerves can breathe. Structure. We've got to release muscle tension, trigger points, knots. We've got to realign the pelvis. It's out of whack. It's out of symmetry. There's an upslip. There's a downslip. There's a rotation. And look, all these things sound good in theory, right? They're, they're, they're in all these textbooks, right, that I spent thousands of dollars on. But here's the real reason that I believe, and anybody, I think, who's done this long enough and specialized enough within this realm of understanding both the mind and the body and working with people in pain, I think would also agree. I believe that treatment works for two primary reasons. Okay? Number one, because the person, you, in pain, believes it will work for them. So there's a positive expectation and or placebo expectation that this thing is going to help me. How can I say this? There's lots of research that shows placebo works, right? For example, we did a study several years back now, and there's been many of them, but it's just one I wanted to highlight, where we looked for the cluster of findings that would predict whether or not someone would respond to getting their neck cracked or would benefit from getting their neck cracked if they had neck pain, right? And guess what? One of the variables was that the person actually believed that that treatment would work for them. The finding that a positive expectation for manipulation or getting their neck cracked hands-on treatment, was predictive of success, is consistent with the fact that expectation of benefit, placebo, has been shown to have a robust effect on pain, pain relief in this case, right? Or not. Take you know the other way. If you don't believe it's going to work for you, ah, uh, this stuff's crazy. Charlie, he's nuts. Probably not going to work for you. And the second thing, sometimes it's not enough to just believe that it'll work. But the second thing is that somehow, in some way, there's many ways to go about doing this. A treatment that ends up working allows the person or you in pain to feel safe mentally and physically. There's that word again, safe. So for example, we can make the body feel safe and or the mind feel safe, or we can do both, right? And again, there's this kind of interaction. I'm going to segregate them for the sake of talking about safety within the system and how you can create that, but realize they're pretty connected, all right? So for example, how might we go about helping someone who, I don't know, has pain when they bend over and it hurts their back or their leg or their butt or whatever. Well, if we can find positive inputs from the body, we'll call them yummy motions, safe motions, motions that feel good, then this provides the body and the mind evidence that movement doesn't have to hurt or be threatening. Safe movements of the body tell the brain that movement isn't bad, right? So you do certain motions that feel good. Oh, wow, I can bend? I was told, right, the bending was bad, but I can bend, that wasn't too bad. No more fear. You become fearless. It's safe to move. Holy smokes, I can do this. You move more. The more you move, the less fear you have, the less pain you have. Movement doesn't hurt. Or you can introduce thoughts and or beliefs of safety and have faith not blindly, but faith in understanding what pain is and how it impacts the pain that we experience, how it can produce pain, and the role that it plays in pain. And this allows the brain to feel safe and puts the body at ease. Not disease, not in a state of disease, disease, but at ease. All right, so let's not, not talk about movement yet. We could literally just educate you and help give you proof, right, that maybe you're not as broken as you think you are or that you've been led to believe. We could also do the opposite, right? A negative input from the brain or a negative thought that I could also plant in your mind. I could tell you that bending is terrible for your back. And every time you bend over, your jelly is going to shoot out the donut. That you need to live in a neutral spine, embrace your core when you move. And guess what? You end up walking like a robot. But what if instead we could teach you and or allow you to look at things in a more positive light? What if we could teach you that hurt doesn't always have to equal harm? And that some pain while you're moving might be okay. 
and that the pain that you're experiencing may not be due to damage, but we can prove to you that it's just a dangerous signal. Then you can start to have belief and conviction in understanding, again, not blindly, that you don't have to be afraid to move. There's less fear. It's safe to move. You move more, less fear. That wasn't so bad. I'm okay. There's less pain. Guess what? Movement doesn't hurt anymore. How cool is that? So by showing your brain and your body that it's safe, you can flip this negative feedback loop that you're currently experiencing to a positive one, right? And through consistent reps, you showing up and applying this to your life, that's what I would ask that you do. You start applying this and these concepts and these nine lessons to your life. There's probably, by the way, like a hundred other lessons in here too. Buckle up, take some notes, go back and rewatch this. Then this changes your pain experience and extinguishes your pain. So you shift yourself from a state of threat to safety. The third lesson that I learned, all right? And this is a big one. So if you're watching this video, you may have the belief system that um, you need to go see someone in person. Right? This, you know, yeah, this virtual stuff is cool. Charlie seems like maybe he knows what he's doing, right? But how is it possible that someone online could actually help me get better? They can't see me. They can't feel me. We can see you, but they can't feel me. And look, I used to believe the same thing. I was an orthopedic manual physical therapist. All right. But I'm telling you, if you're watching this video, if you have that belief, stick around because I'm going to show you and explain to you why self assessment is a better way to assess yourself and fix yourself, meaning you can fix yourself. You're the doctor. I want to make you the doctor better than anyone else can assess you. Self assessment is greater than someone else or a specialist assessment. All right. So, look. At the end of the day, knowingly or unknowingly, you created your pain experience with either your mind or your body or both, right? That unit. Something did it. I didn't do it. No one else, here's the interesting thing, has control over any of those things. So somebody like myself, somebody like the chiropractor down the street, they don't have control over your mind or your body. Now, I guess you could say, well, they do have control of my body because I let them do things to it. I guess if you want to be relying upon them to always do things to it. But at the end of the day, ultimately, you're the one in charge. Your mind or your body created it. You as a person in pain are in potential power, a position of potential power. Why do I say potential power? Because if you don't know what to do, then you're not going to know how to change your mind and remove your body to find relief. But you have control over the two things which created your pain experience, your mind and your body. Nobody else does. So again, I'm at a disadvantage because I can't control those things. Right? But you can if you have the right tools, knowledge, and understanding and resources to know what to do with them, right? And so because it's your pain experience and you know what you're feeling better than anyone else, I think you can agree upon that. You are the best person to evaluate and treat yourself. You just need some help and some coaching to do it. So most people believe that seeing someone in person and having them assess them is superior to them assessing themselves. Do you believe that? Are you watching this video and saying, man, well, like I need, I need somebody to like check my hips. I need somebody to check my pelvis. I need somebody to check my legs. Again, this is all usually based upon the belief that specialists can detect things that you cannot. How could you possibly detect subluxations? You don't have the, all the fancy equipment. You don't have the magic fingers. You need somebody to assess for pelvic rotations, knots, leg length discrepancies, fascial restrictions. This is stuff you pay other people to help you find and fix. The list goes on and on, right? But here's the crazy thing. Research calls all of this into question. Science questions whether or not these things even exist. Knots? What are knots? What are trigger points? Are trigger points truly like knots within the muscle? Modern research questions whether or not trigger points even exist. We think that they're more a function of the nervous system being sensitive than an actual problem within the muscle themselves. All right? Subluxations, rotations, all these things, they sound really cool. A lot of people write a lot of, lot of books about them. But do they even exist? And most research suggests that these things aren't as important as we once thought. And even if they did, even if they were important, they're likely not related to the pain that we experience as humans or that you're experiencing right now. And therefore, all these tests and all these ways of assessing are invalid. Why? Many people have these things, not subluxations, upslips, downslips, rotations. List goes on and on. Wrong with them, but feel no symptoms. Not to mention our ability as specialists, people like myself, 
who trained with some of the top manual therapists in the world from all over the, from all over the world. Our ability to assess and feel these things have been proven time and time again to be very poor. We believe we can feel them. I never did. I was always in the room like, wait a second. You feel that? I don't feel that. Should I feel it? I'm thinking to myself, wow, I must be really bad at this. <laughs> All right. It's very poor. Terrible reliability. These tests are also unreliable for assessing for these things. This is in a manual therapy journal, a chiropractic journal, actually in 2021. Reliability and validity of manual palpation, the ability for us to feel, for the assessment of patients with low back pain, a systematic and critical review. Right. So between 2000 and 2019, 19 years, they looked at 2,023 eligible articles, right? And evidence suggests the reliability of our ability to feel, and the ability for me to agree with someone else, what's happening? Is this a nod? Is this not a nod? Is it rotated this way? Is it rotated that way? Is inconsistent in reliability of kind of feeling bony structures and assessing how well things move, the joints move, for example, is poor. Reliability of our ability to feel and all these tests based upon our ability to feel and the assessment of back pain varies greatly. This is problematic because these tests are commonly used by manual therapists and clinicians and the clinical utility is uncertain. So somebody might be telling you, right? And somebody might be basing your entire treatment program on what they felt was going on with your pelvis. But there's not a reliable or valuable, valid way to assess anything. And research shows that. So our practitioners in 2023 and headed into 2024, are they ignorant of what the science says? I would say yes, most are. Okay. In other words, let's sum this up. All right. Specialists aren't that special. And by the way, just because they say your pelvis is twisted one way and they do something and you feel better doesn't mean that's what actually what happened. Doesn't mean that was the problem and doesn't mean that's, you know, what allowed you to feel better Them yanking it in a certain direction. It could have been that you believe that it would work. And for whatever reason, it allowed you to move better and created safety within the system. Something to think about. Specialists, people like me, aren't that special, right? Meaning... No matter how much we try to convince ourselves that we can feel these things and assess these things, we just can't, all right? We don't have magic hands, that's for darn sure, right? And we can't feel things that you can't feel. And so it's like, okay, well, then what's so special about you, right? And I already said there's really nothing special. But the value and what allows us, what allows me to call myself a specialist in this area, right? Why I'm so passionate about sharing this stuff is because I have a ton of knowledge and experience that I've acquired. And this isn't random knowledge. I'm a physical therapist. I have my board specialty in orthopedics, and I only help people with back, butt, and sciatic problems, and I've worked with over 10,000 people with these issues. All right, so could that be worth something? Probably, right? We'll probably never know everything, but we take all of that, and that's where the value lies. In my mind, you could say, imagine that you had my brain. Would you be watching this video? Would you be perusing YouTube to try to figure out how to get rid of your back, butt, or sciatic issue? Probably not. Right? I wouldn't. I'd know what to do. <laughs> so look, I used to think that I was good at fixing people as a provider. Here I am. Outside of University of Southern California, I think we're getting ready for some Rose Bowl game or something like that. Notre Dame and USC. And this woman, her name is Erica, and I'm cracking her neck. She had some neck stiffness. I'm trying to relocate her first rib. All right. Now, whether I can do it or I can't do it is not the point, but I'm straining. You can't see her face, but she's probably grimacing, right? And I was good. I was good at fixing Erica. I was good at fixing other people in pain with my hands, right, for a day or a week right? or a month. But guess what? The pain and problems always came back because Erica didn't know how to fix herself beyond what Charlie would do to her. And so if you're watching this, you're relying upon someone else to fix you. Ask yourself, what happens when I leave? And if the problem always comes back, it's because that person is not teaching you what to do and how to fix yourself without them. They're not training you to become self-sufficient and independent in resolving your pain. Okay. So I found that people in pain were just terrible at fixing themselves. It's not your fault. Most providers are terrible at fixing people in pain. But when I shifted from fixing people to teaching people so that they could start to think and act like me, and I boiled everything down such that I gave it to people like you. And guess what? Everything changed, right? The goal is to acquire knowledge so that you can figure out why you hurt 
and better understand how to fix yourself so you're never relying upon someone else. How cool would that be, right? Again, everything changed when I shifted from fixing to teaching, all right? For example, Jennifer just shot me this message. This literally just came in. Again, it's January 2nd, 2024 at the time of shooting this video, just a couple of days ago on Christmas. Good morning. It's Christmas, and I had to send this message. Full of gratitude for you in this program. I spent the last couple of weeks reading my house and prepping for guests in Christmas. I could do it with very little pain in some days with none. Three months ago when I joined the program, I could have not done this. As I was thinking about the new year, I was looking to 2024 with daily exercise as a part of my life again. It seriously makes me want to cry. My life has changed and all the lives mine impacts are changed because of you and this program. You are changing the world. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Right? So when I would fix people, they'd say, hey, man, you're awesome. Thanks. Leave me a five-star review. But problem kept coming back. And so when I started to teach people what they needed to do, I chatted with Jennifer maybe a couple of times. I get these random messages from people who are like, dude, you, you, you didn't just fix me. Like You changed my life. You taught me what I need to do so that I'm self-sustainable and I'm not relying upon other people. That is powerful. And so again, if you're watching, if you're like, man, I want to make 2024 a different year where I can become pain-free or 2025 if you're watching this next year, whenever you're watching this, right? Check the link in the description below. We'd be happy to review your case, see if we can help you out. Um, and you can always apply to work with us. We work with people all around the world. All right, David, just a couple of days later. Thank you for the Christmas card, Dr. Charlie. It probably isn't a week that, that passes. I do not think about you, your program, and everything I learned from you. I'm forever grateful for what you did for me, All right? By teaching people what they need to do, you're creating transformation. If you're looking for a transformation, not just more information and or someone else to fix you so that when you hurt, you can just go back to that person. If you want to do that, it's totally cool, but that is not the goal. We want to empower people to resolve their own pain problems. All right. So I no longer fix people, but I teach people what I know so that people can fix themselves. And you can probably tell I get amped up about it. All right. So look, this includes how to self-assess, how to measure progress and how to treat oneself. And the coolest thing about this is that you can use the same process to fix a back butt cytic problem to treat many other things, migraines, chronic neck, shoulder pain, all these different things, same pain relief process. This guy goes by Sean, came to me, back butt cytic problems, labral tears, tendonitis, all kinds of different things. Also had rotator cuff surgery. Now for the program, not only did he fix his hip and his butt problem, right? But shoulder pain is now a distant memory. He just finished a squat session at the gym. 90% of his strength is back. And he did full push-ups for the first time in a decade since his shoulder issue started. Surgery didn't work. His pain persisted, right? We taught him how to fix his butt, and he applied that to his shoulder. All right, it's incredible progress. I wouldn't have believed at the start of the year. Big thanks to Dr. Charlie and the team. Happy New Year. Cool. So the fourth thing, all right, hope y'all are taking notes, okay? You can't manage what you don't measure. Measurement matters. So look, most people gauge their progress or lack thereof by what they think or what they feel. This is totally emotional and subjective, and it's easily influenced. This is the roller coaster, right? I'm good. I'm bad. Charlie, bad day. Help me. Good day. I don't need help. Bad day. Help me, right? We see this all the time. So let's just say this is the, the weather in my area right now as of January 2nd, 2024. Sunday, I guess that would have been like two days ago, right? 42 and sunny. That might be a day where you have less pain. You feel good. Why do you feel good? Because the sun is shining, right? There's, no, there's not a cloud in the sky. Beautiful blues. You are happy. Everyone around you is happy, right? But then this coming Sunday, it's dark, it's rainy, it's dreary. You might feel different, right? And so if you take a subjective emotional approach, I think, I feel, right? How many times you go to the PT or the chiropractor and they're like, hey, how are you doing today? How, how's your pain? And you're like, what do you mean how's my pain? It's raining out. My pain stinks. My friend at work. Another thing that can influence how you feel if you're subjective about this. Your work crew, your family, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, right? Your wife, your kids. They're stressed out. Your pain might be worse. If they're happy, you might be happy. Up and down. You ride the roller coaster of pain. This is a bad question. How are you feeling today, right? I'm feeling good because it's sunny. I'm feeling good because, you know, winter's over and now it's summer. So many things can impact this and it makes it hard to track progress in terms of what's helping or not, right? So just imagine for a moment, here's how you want to think of it. Imagine a world where none of this stuff existed. Imagine if you had no idea it was in your food. Imagine that when you're going to cook, uh, bake cookies, right? You had no measuring cup, no way to measure anything. Imagine that you're trying to build a house or build a bookcase or do something like that. The person who built your house had no tape measure. They had no level, nothing. Imagine you're like, hey, 
I think my car has enough gas to get from point A to point B. You need a gauge, thermometers, scale. Imagine trying to lose weight without a scale. That would be difficult, especially difficult if you didn't have a scale and you didn't have nutritional facts and you didn't have something to measure your food. <laughs> these things are useful. There's a reason that we've created these devices. But we don't have one to measure, track our pain. So what do we do? All right, blood pressure cuff to measure blood pressure. Right? So if we didn't have these things, houses would be crooked. Recipes would be a disaster. Right? You'd have no idea if you were gaining or losing weight. Blood pressure meds, insulin for diabetes, stuff like that. Right? It wouldn't be prescribed. Because there's no way to measure it in the first place. It's not a problem if you don't make it a problem. If you don't measure it. Right? It's crazy. So the next natural question is like, Dr. Charlie, what are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that we create a ruler, a tape measure for identifying what's happening within our movement system and with the pain that we're experiencing, experiencing so that we can understand how it's doing, how we're progressing, or if we're not. And therefore, we can manage it. You can't manage what you don't measure. All right. Now, I've created something called the total body scan. All right. The total body scan gives you a way to measure how your body is feeling and moving in a way that just makes sense to you. You can see and you can feel it. You've got your medical diagnosis. If you're watching this video right now, how confident do you feel in telling me what the heck is going on with that and what to do about it, how to fix it? Surgeons and radiologists can't even look at that and figure out what's going on and how to fix it. So there's no way that you can do it. And most of the world is glued to trying to fix or treat their medical diagnosis. Hey, Dr. Charlie, I have a herniated disc. Look, it's right there. It's right there. And so what is the exercise for the disc problem? That is outside of you. It's something you don't understand. It's foreign to you. It's in a different language, if you will. A spondylolisthesis, an annular tear at L4, L5. Why not translate it into something that makes sense, that you can see, feel, and experience? You know how to move your body better than anybody else. Why not translate a medical diagnosis into a movement diagnosis? You can identify easily and consistently certain movements maybe that make you feel worse, for example. Or maybe... You can identify emotions that make you feel worse. And that's common too. And it tells us something, right? So we can translate your medical diagnosis into a movement diagnosis. And the total body scan is the ultimate self-assessment tool that gives you an objective measure of how your body is moving, what motions feel yucky. Everyone knows what yucky is. doesn't feel good. Reproduces your pain or sensations that you're experiencing. And to what extent they are yucky or painful. And this is it. This is the total body scan. So you got six motions and you do them on the right and left side of the body. Everybody I work with goes through this process. Sometimes people find many motions that are yucky. Sometimes all the motions are yummy and that means something as well. So it's not about what it means per se. It's just about trying to measure and objectify. Just because something is 45 inches long, it's not good or bad. It shouldn't make you happy or sad. It's just 45 inches long. And then you can change what you need. You can cut off some, you can add some. You can buy something different if it's not going to fit in there. But data, you need data. So we go through each of these motions on the right and left side of the body, comes out to about 14 different motions. And then you measure it. Right? You can objectify it. When you do a certain motion, you can use a scoring system to record how yucky these motions feel. If you do a motion, kick your leg up or you twist your trunk, and it's not yucky at all, doesn't reproduce any pain or sensations, then it's yummy. But if you feel something, then it's either low, medium, or high yucky. And if it's low yucky, yeah, I did that thing, I feel it a little bit. Okay, well, 10, 20, 30. The higher the number, the worse it is. Well, that's a 30. Okay. Medium, 40, 50, 60. High, 70, 80, 90. This is a game changer for you if you're in pain and you're not tracking progress. Coming up with something, even if it's not perfect, to measure what's happening so you can make decisions based off logic and data and not emotion. Here's an example. Just took this off of somebody's um, sheet, somebody who works with us personally, um, to help you see what I mean. Twist right, twist left. Need a chest right, need a chest left, figure four right, figure four left, leg raise, boom, 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 boom. Maybe none of these motions make you feel worse. That's okay. Maybe you have a motion that you know of that's not on here. Hopping on one leg, maybe that bothers your hip. That's fine. Running, that's, it's multiple motions. So you probably have something yucky in here, but a way to assess where things are at at baseline. Then what's cool is you can identify right, something you can track such that you can look week to week to tell what's happening. Hey, I've got these yucky motions. I'm having trouble with these things. And I'm moving in the right direction. Now, what are you doing to move in the right direction? Well, if you're doing a whole sheet of exercise, you're going to have no, no clue what's moving in the right direction, right? But let's give you a systematic way 
to assess what's happening and make decisions based off of, hey, I'm no better, I'm better, or I'm worse. So making decisions, again, based off data and logic and being objective versus emotion is the only way that I've found now, in the past, and in the future, right, to determine what's working versus what's not. And here's what's most important and what to do next. So the challenge for people is that they have a hard time becoming or being outcome independent. If you're not measuring things, you're going based off feelings and fluff all the time. Then you go for a week and it doesn't work. And you put your head down. I say to someone, hey, how is that treatment working? Well, I think it's working. I'm like, well, okay, you don't have to think something's working, right? Meaning if you have to think your car started today, did it start? Probably not. If you have to think that you ate breakfast, do you eat breakfast? Probably not. <laughs> and so if you have to think that you're feeling better, then you're probably not feeling better. Well, how long do you want to keep doing that treatment that you think is working? And what's crazy is some people say a week, some people say a month, some people say three months. It's totally up to whatever amount of time they want to basically kill. And so if you follow a process and you can measure things and track things objectively, then you can look at the data for what it is, just numbers, just object objective data. You can separate yourself from the situation, remove the emotion as much as possible and say, what can I learn from this? Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. There is no failure. There is only feedback. And if you're taking a scientific approach, and you're isolating variables, and you're being not only systematic, but scientific, changing one or two things at a given time, you can say, hey, that didn't work. And that's all it means is that didn't work. We need to change. Here's what we're going to do. Boom. Okay. It's an iterative process. The fifth thing all right, that I took away after reviewing 1,352 cases, back button sciatica issues in 2023, this is key. All right. Environment is greater than exercise. The number one thing that people think they need to do to solve their problem is more and more exercise. I get emails every day from people all over the world. And maybe you even found this video because you're looking for the exercise to solve your problem. Maybe it's out there. I found, right, that most people only need one exercise to solve the problem. It's a little bit beyond the point. But guess what? Environment is way more important than the exercises that you're going to do. And I'll explain why. Okay. So I'm going to show you a little scale here in a second. But most people, trying to relieve pain, have a scale, a healing scale, we'll call it, or a yummy yucky scale, right? That looks like this. On the left side, you've got all the yucky things that are keeping you in pain. On the right side, you've got all the things you're doing to try to make you feel better. So pain, big ball of yucky. I'll do all these things that make me feel better. Just do, do, do. The more I do, the more I feel like I'm trying to solve this, the better I'm going to get. No, the more confused you're going to become. So if the ultimate goal is to tip that scale, towards the right, to healing. How could you do it in the easiest and quickest way possible? Easiest and quickest way possible. There are two primary ways you can do it, right? You could add more yummies to the right side of the scale, add more smileys, or you can subtract yuckies from the left side of the scale. And adding more yummies to the right side of the scale is what almost every, I would say 99.9% .9 of people want to do in pain, right? Because you've been led to believe either by someone else or by just your own human psychology, being emotional about what you're doing, that the more I do, the better I'll get. And doing more looks like I'm going to search YouTube. I'm going to do more exercises. By the way, the PT is also a human and is not very scientific about their approach probably, or the chiro or the massage therapist or the, the orthopedic doctor who handed you a sheet of exercises and had you walk out the door and said, just do these. When something's not working, I've got all this junk that's not working. I'm going to just going to add more junk on top of junk. That's a bad idea. It's like patching a roof that's like, you know, you have a hole in the roof, right? Uh, and, you know, you're just, you're just patching it, patching it, patching it, rather than actually like doing what you need to do to make sure that it doesn't leak anymore. All right. I see a water stain on the ceiling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint and prime over it. Pretend like it's not there. Maybe this will work. It's not going to work. You're not solving the problem. Okay. It also looks like seeking out more and more people to help you when the professional, the person you're seeing currently isn't helping you. And I call this like doctor hopping. You go from one specialist to the next, one chiro, one PT, one orthopedic doctor, one neurologist to another, hoping that someone can fix you. But they can't because healing comes from within. You might be getting more and more tests. I just worked with someone who had seven MRIs done. That's not uncommon. When, one, when an x-ray doesn't show something, you get another x-ray. Maybe the second one will find something in a person. Maybe the third one. And it will. It'll find something. Because x-rays and MRIs show problems with almost everybody in the world. But is it the cause of your pain? Probably not. And so people just go down like this, this path and, and go on this frenzy of just getting all kinds of different tests because there must be something there. And they're killing all this time 
when they could have been living in action, doing what I'm about to share here in a moment, right? And solving the problem. And people think that by getting more tests and figuring out what's going on, it'll form them about what to do, but it usually leads them down a rabbit hole. So trying to heal by addition, doing more seems to make sense. Logically, it's like, yep, yeah, cool. The harder I work, the, the, the better I'll do. So many areas of life, right, have proven that to be true. You want to get better grades, you probably study more. Right? You want to make more money, and maybe you work more, right? That type of thing. But you want to get out of pain, you don't have to do more. You have to do less, all right? So why do people do this? Right? It's new. It's exciting. There's a dopamine hit. You're going to chase that next shiny object. It's going to make you feel like you're doing something and trying everything to get better, all of which are true. But there's a few problems with this, right? And you are probably experiencing these right now. You're constantly trying to exercise and meet with new doctors. It's unfamiliar. It's exhausting. It's frustrating, right? And it just zaps you of all your resources, time, energy, and money. And many times, here's the real kicker. Many times what you think you're doing to help you because some really smart person with a white coat, right, at the Mayo Clinic told you to do it, but actually be keeping you from healing. And you just don't know it. That stinks. You're paying for someone who's making you worse. <laughs> all right. So here's yummy, yucky scale. So you've got all this stuff. We'll call it life, keeping you from getting better. Now, everybody wants to ignore that. Doctors don't have time for this. They don't, they don't pay you to educate patients. You're in and you're out. Then you've got all this stuff on the yummy side of the equation, all the stuff you're doing. People are addicted to doing. But that massage you're doing, could it be making you worse? Could pressing on that painful area in your butt cheek, be reducing blood supply and oxygen and nutrients that the nerve and the body needs to heal, could it actually be keeping you from healing? The yoga, yoga is good for back pain, right? Could that be keeping you from getting better? Because it's putting in all the yucky positions and it's just replicating your yucky motions over and over again. Probably. <laughs> the x-ray and MRI that you thought would so clearly indicate what was happening actually just freaks you out, puts you more and deeper into the pain fear cycle and indebts you to a diagnosis that boxes you in. We know x-rays and MRIs make people worse for those reasons. They can't figure out what the heck's going on in most cases. They show all kinds of things wrong with people that may or may not be the cause of pain. And they freak you out, lead you down a rabbit hole treatment. All the stretches, do the figure four, do this, do that. Keep neutral spine, do the bird dog, do the big three. Could be making you worse. Chiropractic, acupuncture, so on and so forth. All right. So sometimes the stuff you're doing that you think is helping you might actually be keeping you from healing. And so you've got to spend some time on the yucky side of the equation, analyzing the environment to identify what things physically and mentally are keeping you from healing. Do that first. Unload the left side of the scale so that the right side, right side tips more easily. You have to do less to get it to do so. So what if there was an easier, quicker way, shortcut to relief, subtract yucky from the left side of the scale? We just talked about this, and the analogy is really straightforward. I, uh, I think you would agree with this. You cannot exercise a bad diet. It just doesn't make sense, right? You can run on the treadmill all you want, uh, but if you're popping donuts as you're running on the treadmill, you probably ain't going to lose weight, <laughs> right? And so have you, hypothetically, right? been running on the treadmill, trying all kinds of stretches, going to see all these doctors, but you're still eating the donuts. You still sleep in the same way. You haven't done the detective work to figure out why it hurts when you sit in certain chairs and not in others. You haven't asked yourself the difficult questions to determine if it's stress and or other psychological danger signals might be influencing your pain. You can do all the exercise you want, but you cannot exercise the bad diet. And then people wonder why they go, they get the exercise, they get the, the quick hit, the treatment, the decompression, but then they go home and the problem always comes back. You haven't addressed your environment. So if you would agree that it's going to be hard to lose weight if you're eating donuts while you're running at the same time, right? And that, that doesn't make sense. Then I hope that you would also agree, and I believe you would also agree, that it doesn't make sense to try to out-exercise a yucky environment that is actually keeping you from healing, picking the scab in some way, shape, or form. Number six. What did I learn in 2023? Sixth thing here, education versus intelligence. This might offend some people. I'm not here to be everybody's friend. I'm just here to kind of share with you my experience, okay? So here is what I've seen. Do not mistake education for intelligence, all right? Never confuse education with intelligence. Intelligence isn't the ability to remember and repeat like they taught you in school. It's the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, be dynamic, if you will, in the way that you're thinking, and use our knowledge to adapt to new situations, adapt, reason, not be robotic and just reinstating facts, all right? Never confuse education with intelligence. You can have a PhD and still be an idiot, all right? Interesting quote, all right? So this is the stuff, right? This bookshelf right here, right? This is the stuff that I memorized in PT school. 
They don't teach me how to think. They teach me how to memorize stuff. Kinesiology flashcards. These have seen better days. He's got a hair tie wrapped around it. Vastus lateralis. This is the stuff I had to memorize. Originates from the lateral lip of the linea aspera and greater trochanter of the femur. Inserts the tibial tuberosity of the patellar tendon. It extends the knee and is supplied or controlled by the femoral nerve L2, L, predominantly L3, L4. I mean, really sexy stuff. Sound really smart in the academic setting. But guess what? You go out into the world and nobody cares. Okay? <laughs> Meaning, this stuff is only going to get you so far. So if you're seeing someone who has all these degrees on the wall, and they can show for the fact they've memorized all kinds of different things, right? They've also got to be apply, able to apply what they've learned, right? There's, there's doctor of PT, USC, orthopedic resident, right? Really cool stuff. Looks smart on paper. But if I can't think through solving problems and I can't apply basic science, the scientific method, and I'm always jumping around and treating people in different ways and doing different things, I'm always changing the playbook, then you're never going to be able to gather enough experience to solve the problem. And so is your doctor someone who approaches things very systematically? Or is it kind of helter skelter, we'll try this, we tr we'll try that. You can have a, a really high level degree, but you might make no sense. So like I said before, doctors, PTs, chiros, by the way, we're all kind of doctors, teachers, educators. Dr. Charlie Johnson is what they said when I walked across the stage, right? MDs, neurologists, orthodox, those people, chiros, scientific degrees, degrees based in research and science. And yet most people you see to solve this are scientists who fail to apply basic science. They, they know everything. They know all these flashcards, right? They're like a book when you ask them about certain things. Oh, but, but what were the basics again? You got to know the basics. And this is the, these are the basics. And it just makes sense. The scientific method applied to healing. The scientific method is like, look, you observe a problem. You have maybe a question about it. Oh, I wonder why I'm hurting. You come up with a hypothesis. Notice I didn't say you have to have a million hypotheses. You just come up with one, right? And then you run an experiment. You don't run 100 experiments all at the same time. You run an experiment. And then you come to some conclusion. You analyze the results. If you don't have data and your conclusion and your results is, well, well, how do you feel today? How's your pain? It's too fluffy. It can be influenced by a million things. But if you look at the data, you can do this. I did this and you couldn't do this. And we're scientific about the way that we approach resolving pain. And we have data to lead us in different directions based off of the results right, of that study or that experiment. Um, then we can iterate this process and we can get closer to the truth. If you ask me, that's the only way to solve a problem, right? Imagine you're like, hey, right, this cake doesn't taste good. I wonder if uh, I wonder if we need to do this, right? Probably a bad example. But then you go ahead and you throw 10 different ingredients into the pot. And the conclusion is like, oh, well, like, like you wouldn't know. <laughs> There's too many independent, independent variables. And so this is what science looks like to the traditional PT or chiropractor, or orthopedic doctor who treats these problems. We're going to give you six different things to try and hope that they work. I mean, how scientific does that sound? And not to mention that, they're testing all kinds of different hypotheses at one time. <laughs> so they're mixing hypotheses and mixing different experiments. Don't believe me? Here's the idea, right? So pelvic tilt, right? Or we'll call it exercise number one, right? And then trunk stability, right? They're pretty much the same thing. They're teaching you to create stability within the system. Maybe there's a belief and or a hypothesis or a question in the person's mind or your mind that your core is weak. So let's do exercise number one and exercise number two, three, four, five. Let's do these two, testing the same hypothesis. You could say very similar. We need more stability, more control, more contraction in the core, more stiffness, more stability, move less. And then the second exercise, the piriformis stretch. Forget about the core. That, that's one hypothesis. But at the same time, we're going to have you stretch your butt cheek because we think that'll work. So which is it? Is it a core problem or is it a butt cheek problem? I don't know. My guess is as good as yours, right? The third thing. You know what? I know 
with the pelvic tilt and then the trunk stability thing here, I know we said we wanted you to be more stable, but I actually lied. We want you now to have more motion. Forget about all the stability stuff. We want you to move more now and, and bend backwards because they said you had a disc problem. Just go do that. No. You're mixing experiments and testing multiple hypotheses at one time. It's no wonder you're lost and confused. Oh, by the way, not only do you need more motion backwards, but I think you might also need it in the rotary position. You might also need more twistiness in your spine or your trunk. You might be stiff there. Oh, and by the way, don't just go to the right. Go to the left, too. We'll go right and left because the more we do, the better we'll get, right? No, you're lost and you're confused. All right. The fifth hypothesis. Screw all the other hypotheses. Don't tighten your stomach muscles. It's not a core thing. Don't bend backwards. Don't twist your trunk. You don't need more motion there. Your buttock doesn't need more length or more mobility, more stretchiness. It actually needs more strength. Contract your glutes. Let's do glute bridges. Your glutes are weak. You've got glute amnesia or dead butt syndrome. No, you don't. You're all right. Okay. Do you see how this is just such an unscientific approach from somebody who has a degree on the wall that says doctor of physical therapy, doctor of chiropractic, doctor of osteopathic pathic medicine, MD. This is not the way to solve a problem. Blindly just throw darts at a board and hope you hit the bullseye. Okay. Random inputs equal random outputs. It's no wonder you're not improving if you're taking that approach. More equals more confused. No question. Especially when you're trying to run a scientific experiment, right? And you understand the basics of science. Boring equals better. That's a big nugget. Boring equals better. It doesn't have to be hard. So many people have a belief system. Like, I've tried everything. My case is complicated. How could it be that easy? Well, your case is so complicated that you tried all these complicated solutions and it hasn't worked. So at what point are you willing to let go of the belief that a complicated problem doesn't need necessarily a complicated solution? Could it be just one or two things you need to do? A lot of people can't break that belief. And so they're constantly stuck in trying lots of different things to solve the problem because they feel like they need to do more because the problem must be, the problem is so complex that it needs uh, some really kind of, I don't know, in-depth or, or uh, profound solution. All right. Most people, in fact, when they do use motion to solve the problem are just one motion away. If you have a structurally based problem in your back, your butt, your leg, most people find just one motion using a very systematic scientific process for finding the one motion that's going to work for them. Okay. You don't have to believe me, but th this is my experience. Okay. So the seventh thing I learned in 2023 is to trust the process. Number eight and number nine, this is good. Number eight and number nine, you got to stick around for that because they are killer. All right. Um, trust the process. All right. So this is the process that we use and we teach to people all around the world with back butt sciatic issues. Notice how movement is not first. First, we've got to do the detective work to figure out mentally and physically what is picking the scab and keeping people from getting better. It's healing by subtraction. That's looking at the yummy side of, or the yucky side of the scale and saying, what here is causing part of the problem? Because right? again, you can do all the exercise you want, but if that's the case and something's holding you back, you ain't going to get better. Then we teach people how to measure. If you don't have a baseline foundation for what is what is um, level and what is plumb, right? And here's where I'm starting. And here's how much I weigh when I step on the scale day one. Then you don't know where you're deviating, either in the right direction, you're stuck, or in the wrong direction. You've got to have a way to measure what's happening with the body. We use total body scan. And we can look at this and make decisions, again, based off of data. Then we teach you to use mind and movement as medicine. Right? Any given medicine you take has a certain prescription. It's not about doing a sheet of exercises. One motion. Ideally, you don't, you don't go to the CVS and they give you 10 pills right, if you have a headache. I hope not. Right? Um, if so, they're probably giving you one to counteract the side effects of the others, etc. But at the end of the day, movement is medicine. Think of movement like a pill. And all pills have a certain prescription on them, a dose of frequency and the timing. How much should you do it? How often should you do it? When do you do it? You can get very precise with using movement as medicine to solve these issues. Really cool stuff. And then you've got to talk about getting back to life full speed, right? And preventing problems with as much certainty as possible in the future. So saw this the other day, very, um, I don't know, very true when it comes to getting out of pain. All right. People want to be a part of the outcome. Everybody, everybody wants to have the outcome of being pain free and getting back to a life that they love. But how many people are like, Hey man, just teach me the process. They don't want to know the process, right? You're watching this be like, I don't, you probably off this video by now. If you're still watching it, kudos to you. Everyone wants to be pain-free, but few want to follow a process. Just tell me the exercise, Charlie. I'll do it. Just tell me. Right. Well, would you like to understand why you're doing the exercise and like 
Can we test some things? No, just tell me. Okay. <laughs> Not going to work. All right. This woman on my YouTube channel, right? On another video here, Bridget says, I need solutions. Dang it. <laughs> I need solutions. This video was teaching people what not to do to heal a problem in their body. But everyone mistakes the absence of doing as not doing anything. Don't make that same mistake. Subtracting things and isolating what's helping, what's not helping, again, physically and mentally, is the first part to that process that I showed you earlier. Because you can't exercise a bad diet. But Bridget doesn't understand this. And maybe you don't understand this. It's okay if you don't, but... In my experience, most people don't understand this, and they say things like, just show me the exercise. I need solutions. As if learning what not to do, which continues to aggravate your problem, is not a solution. It is part of the solution in the first step. This is very much a doing culture. Tell me what to do, not what not to do. I don't care about that. It's like people are blinded to the value in it. Right? So most people are looking for treatments that offer a quick fix, and many of these treatments do offer relief All right, temporarily. But because they focus on teaching you the what and fail to teach you the why and the how come and answer the what ifs, and the problem always comes back. So if someone gives you the answers to a test, let's say a math test, you're going to pass the test short term. But without understanding of how and sort of why you arrived at that conclusion or that answer, then you're going to fail long term. You're going you're to pass you know, algebra. You're going to pass your math course, pass geometry. But then when you're like in a corner, trying to like cut a piece of wood because you decided to be a, a craftsman. You, you're not going to know, right? Like how to make a fit. You're going to be that person when, when you, you pass the math test, you got the PhD in math, right? But then you go to the counter and, and you don't know how to deliver change to someone. You'll fail when it comes to life. Right? Just tell me the exercise, Charlie. I want the outcome. I don't want the process. That's like saying to your fire at home, just give me heat and I'll give you wood. Dang it, fire. J just warm me up and then I'll feed you and I'll give you wood. And, and we know it doesn't work like that. So determining what you need to do to naturally heal is an iterative process, an iterative process, constantly evolving and changing, putting pieces of the puzzle together. That involves deep detective work and testing. You've got to be okay with that. It doesn't have to be a slow process, by the way. If you're willing to step back, Break some of the beliefs, see things for what they are, which is just like a big puzzle piece, and you can have somebody put you, help you put the pieces together, then oftentimes it falls together really quickly. But you've got to make the right first few steps. In my opinion, these are some of the right first few steps. All right? Recovery is not linear. Realize there are going to be ups and downs. And so what I would recommend is that you make actions or the process of resolving your pain, the goal, not the outcome. Make just showing up and putting in the study and the effort needed to figure out what you need to do to solve the problem, the goal, not the outcome. Again, if you're interested in learning what that process is and seeing if we can help and submitting details of your case, check the link below inside the uh, comments or description. Okay. So if you take the right actions and follow the right process, the outcome naturally follows. We call this outcome independence. Right? If you just show up and you practice stringing the guitar every single day, or anything for that matter. What are the chances that if you do that long enough that you're not going to get pretty good at playing the guitar? Now, you have a coach, you have somebody who teaches you kind of and shows you the ropes, but what are the chances that you would just fail? Not very high. Same with the process we teach people. If you focus on the pain relief process, then pain relief naturally follows. Okay? This again is the process. It's very systematic. It's worked for thousands of people. All right? It just works. Number 8. All right? This is super important. Maybe I should have, again, this is no particular order of the lessons that I've learned in 2023, but uh, th this is really important, okay? More important than anybody gives it credit for, all right? I don't know how to emphasize that enough, all right? Beliefs inform actions which inform results. Beliefs, actions, results, all right? If you believe something about what you have wrong with you and what's good or bad or whatever, right, then you will take actions consistent with that belief, and then that will deliver you some result, good, bad, or indifferent. For example, let's just say you have a herniated disc. You were told you have it. You believe, for whatever reason, you believe you have a herniated disc of some type. What do you think of this exercise? Just go ahead. Gut reaction. What do you think of this exercise? Is this a good exercise for a herniated disc? Is this something you should do? Or is this bad for a herniated disc? 
is this good or bad? You have a herniated disc. Is this good or bad? Would you recommend that someone do this? Would you try this? Or have you been led to believe this is not what you should do? Or that you should do it? I'm just indifferent to the two, but I'm just asking you, what is your gut reaction? Now, let's just say you have spinal stenosis. Right? So you had a herniated disc and the jelly's bulging out the, out the back, but now you got spinal stenosis where you know moving in certain ways actually causes less space for the nerves travel. Is this a good exercise or is it not? And again, this is a little litmus test to see where your belief system lies, to see how strongly you buy into certain things over others. Is this a good exercise for spinal stenosis? How about this? Does this help open the central canal and create more space for your nervous system or less? Only you can decide. But here's the thing. Most of the time, you're not the one deciding. Most people have been led to believe if you have a herniated disc and your jelly's you know, popping out the back, it's out the donut, you want to push it back in, right? So you do this exercise. But what if this thing is not working? You have a belief. That's what you have wrong with you. This is a good exercise. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. Because that, that's what the person, the McKenzie practitioner told you to do. That's what your physical therapist, your chiropractor, your doctor told you to do. That was, that's what was on the sheet of exercises. Do you, do you ignore the data and do you keep going? Most people would. I know that's what I need to do. Oh, heck no, Charlie. That's bad. That's bad. That's going to make me worse. But then in the next breath, they'll go on to say how when they sit down, all their pain goes away. And when they stand up or arch backwards, their pain gets worse. Symptoms. And the data is telling them one thing, but their belief system is telling them another. And so most people will avoid doing this so they don't hernia disc because it's bad, bad. Notice the label. Spinal So you can't do this because when you bend backwards, it reduces the space for the nerves travel. It pinches the nerves more. Does it really? Does not. This is good. And you see this whole, this is good, this is bad argument. But what if I was to tell you, let's just say again, you've got a disc herniation or protrusion or something like that. But some science and research actually shows the opposite of maybe what most people believe. For example, it's MRI taken in standing. If you bend backwards, the disc protrusion actually increases. Look at the disc bulges. That same person, when they bend forward, the disc protrusion, the disc herniation reduces. This is not me making this up. This is an exception. And so, sure, lots of people might like bending backwards, but for some people, bending forward actually makes the disc protrusion smaller. And so, if I were to show you this, now all of a sudden, do you say to yourself, you know what? This is a good exercise, and that's a bad one. Well, I don't know. Oh, this is another example, right? This guy had a disc uh, extrusion and or large protrusion in his spine, L5-S1, I believe. And this is the motion, Dow is his name, bending forward and twisting. Is bending and twisting good or bad for disc herniations? Well, we tried press-ups for a month and nothing helped. Guess what solved this problem? This one motion. Again, we use movement as medicine, dose, frequency, and time. How much? Five 45 second holds. How often? Eight times a day. Might sound crazy. One motion, by the way, right? As needed. Timing. He has a disc problem. Dow's disc loves bending forward and twisting. But if you don't follow a scientific approach and you only treat your belief system and not your symptoms, you could be stuck. Right? It makes you question everything. And what I say is like, look, beliefs are like dominoes. When I chat with people, or I've reviewed these 1,352 cases just this past year and over 10,000 people in total, you start to pick up on what these, what these barriers are to getting better. If Dow calls me like, hey, man, I have this terrible disc herniation and my pelvis is all twisted, I'm like, already he's got a lot of beliefs that probably aren't true and are keeping him from healing. I was told I had this wrong with me. There's multiple beliefs that we have to break down. Which of these beliefs do you have? And what other beliefs do you have? Write them down. Put them in the comments if you want. Slouching is bad. Your core is weak. Sleeping on your belly is bad. You're out of alignment. Your pelvis is unstable. You have this diagnosis or cause for why you hurt, and therefore, right, this exercise is good or bad. All this right or wrong, good versus bad, or kind of the cause of your pain, this is sort of uh, creates the foundation of the belief system. What's so crazy about this is your beliefs can either help or hinder you on your road to recovery. So are you willing to sort of create a blank slate? Look, if what you're doing is working, awesome, right? But if it's not working and you still are around to watch this video, then you probably need to shift some of those beliefs. You don't have to do it blindly. You can do it with a coach, somebody like myself. And if you want, 
you can try to break them on your own. Change your story, change your life. Divorce the story and or the belief system that you hold, and you can resolve your pain. I pretty much guarantee it. Tony Robbins. Number nine, really powerful stuff here. Kind of ties into number one, mind over body. Fear versus faith. Remember how earlier I had, you know, I said that, hey, a lot of people have a couple roadblocks when it comes to resolving this problem. Number one, they feel that they're not the doctor. So maybe you feel like, man, I'm not as smart as you, Charlie, right? Um, I can't figure this out. Uh, and I need to go to someone like you, Charlie, to see them in person so that they can touch and feel me. Hopefully we've proven that is probably not the case. All right. And that you can, uh, you understand your pain experience better than anybody else. But the other thing is like, will this work for me, right? How do I know that you can help me, Charlie? Will this treatment work or will it not? Fear versus faith. A massive thing that I would say is at the root of almost all successes or failures in life in almost any endeavor. When given the ability to choose, most people choose fear over faith. I could have chosen not to shoot this video because I was worried what someone would comment because I know I'll get some nasty ones, but also get some nice ones too. Can you overcome the fear? Do you choose fear? Do you choose faith? Now, again, we don't do this blindly. Let me explain how this shows up for people with back button sciatica problems. And ask yourself, is that something that's maybe holding me back and actually fueling the pain that I'm experiencing? So look, you have your reasoning mind, your conscious mind, your thinking mind. You have a choice. You have a choice to focus on what is well, what isn't so well, negative and or positive. And on the negative side of the equation, we'll kind of label it as ignorance. This is sort of the root of this negative side of the equation. Ignorance, not like you're an ignorant person, as my mom would say about people growing up. I still don't even really know what that meant. It had just a rude, a bad person, right? Like you're an ignorant, not knowing. You're not knowing of something. Therefore, the opposite of not knowing is knowing, knowledge. We'll kind of call that the positive side of the equation. And so in your conscious mind, you have x-rays, MRIs that you've been shown. You've talked to friends and family and tell you what could be going on. You're mindlessly searching YouTube for a solution, seeing all kinds of um, contradictory opinions about the cause of pain. Right. And you choose to get emotionally involved in those thoughts, but you have thoughts of worry and doubt. Now, why would you consciously choose to be worried and doubtful about your ability to get better? Everything else got better. The bruise, the paper cut, all that stuff that got better for you. Why would your back or your disc not get better? You lack understanding, right? About what's causing your pain, about what pain is, about what's going on, because you can't see it like you can see your finger, right? There's some type of worry or doubt. There's some lack of knowing or understanding about what's happening. there, And so you choose to get emotionally involved with that. You have a lot of what ifs. What if it's this? What if, what if it's a tumor? What if I broke something? What if it's this type of problem? What if this doesn't work? What if, Charlie, your treatment solution doesn't work? What if the chiropractor can't help me? What if I never get back to running or biking or hiking or whatever? What if my case is special or different? Rather than... Hey, look, I'll be better before I know it. What can I learn from this pain that I'm experiencing? It's a growth-oriented or based question. What is this trying to tell me? What if this does work? Notice it took the same amount of breath to say, what if this does work versus what if it doesn't work? And yet everybody will say, what if this doesn't work? The skeptic in us. So you've got this conscious mind where you have choice, negative, positive, ignorance, not knowing, the opposite is knowledge, right? You have thoughts, you know, uh, the stuff that's been planted in your mind, x-rays, MRIs, and all the information there, all kinds of stuff. And you have worry and doubt. You choose to get emotionally involved with those things, ask yourself all those questions I just listed. And the subconscious emotional mind pops up this experience of fear, fearful, frustrated. And that shows up in the body right, as anxiety. Right, so dis ease within the psychology and or the mind can create disease within the body. If pain is a dangerous signal, so is fear and frustration and worry and concern and all these other things you get involved with. Dis ease within the mind can create disease, pain, numbness, tingling, burning, shooting, stabbing, all those things we talked about early on in the body, in your back, in your butt, in your leg, in your head, in your eyes, in your mouth, wherever. So knowledge is your potential ticket to freedom if you know how to apply it appropriately. Again, knowledge is the 
opposite of ignorance or not knowing, instead of having warrior doubt, is it possible that somebody could take the time, like I am here today, to educate you on what you need to do to solve a problem? You could actually start to understand what's happening and what you need to do, and you're not relying on someone else to fix you. It is possible. Well, guess what it takes? Study. You just devoted about an hour of your time probably watching this video. Don't jump to something else. Go back and study it. Study my channel, if you were, or study other people's channel, whatever you want to do, right? But you've got to study. And so through study, with, of course, someone who knows what the heck they're doing, right? A specialist, if you will, as long as they're willing to take what they know and give it to you, then you can start to have understanding and faith in that understanding that you too can solve the problem. What is the opposite of fear? Faith. And as you'll see here in a moment, right? Both fear and faith demand that you believe in something you cannot see. Something that lies in the future. Worry and doubt? Will this, I, I wonder if this will work. What if it does work? All stuff in the future you cannot see. But both fear and faith demand that you believe in that. And it takes no more effort to choose one or the other, but we always choose the fear. So you're going to choose to be a skeptic. Ah, uh, it's just something else that won't work. Or is there maybe something to this? Does your inability to improve have to do a little bit with your belief system and your current worldview of what pain is and how you can solve the problem? If you're willing to acknowledge that, then there's an opportunity to heal. Okay. So you can have faith, not blindly, just taking my word for it. But because we're teaching you what you need to do, giving you the tools, knowledge, and understanding resources to understand this stuff through study, instead of spending you know, half an hour to drive to an appointment and sit there for 10 minutes, lay on the table while the PT is working with other people, right? Spend an hour at PT and then a half an hour, you know, two hours, two, three times a week, nine hours a week to solve your problem. In which case, they're not teaching you what you need to do. They're just telling you what you need to do. But could you devote that same amount of time to empower yourself with all that is necessary to heal naturally? So you can have faith in understanding through self-study and again, fear and faith, both to many, you believe in something you cannot see. It's your choice. It's your choice. You're going to do something after you watch this video. If you want our help, click the link below. If you don't want our help, that's totally fine too. Okay, but it's your choice. Just recognize that. All right. So again, faith and understanding. Create somebody who's more relaxed, more calm. There's well-being. Guess what? The body's more at ease. There's the absence of fear and frustration and worry and concern and anxiety and all these things. Because you're like, I know what I need to do. I'm just going to follow the process. Cool. At ease. If pain is a danger signal, pain equals fear plus some sensation, numbness, tingling, whatever, and all the worries and concern around that sensation, then as soon as you get rid of the fear, as soon as you get rid of the response to it, then you just have a sensation. If you can change your reaction to pain versus always focusing on the pain itself, and as mind stuff might seem a little funky, but if you can understand what pain is and what pain isn't, and you can follow a process, the one that we outlined, for example, again, in my experience, one that works really well, one that I developed, um, then you can absolutely solve this problem because you can have faith in knowing that um, if you follow it, you will get the results that you're looking for. Okay, And a body that is at ease right, is generally more healthy than the one that is in disease. Right? Okay, so again, where does all this worry and doubt come from? Well, here you are looking for a solution. You, you've got arthritis, says the surgeon. You'll need surgery. This is you going to other people rather than you looking within yourself. You're looking without versus looking within. You've got inflammation. You're going to need these pills, your, your family care doc, right? Your massage therapist. Of course you have knots everywhere. Why? Because that's what they do. That's what you're paying them for. Let me ask you this. If you went to the massage therapist and they're like, wow, I don't think you need a massage. You're totally good today. I don't sense any tension. Do you really think they would say that? They wouldn't say that. <laughs> That's not their belief system. And it's clearly not your belief system if you're going to see them. You're weak if you go to PT. You need core strength. You need hip strength. You need stretching. You need all this stuff. Google, let's not even talk to Google because, well, again, you're not alive. You have some rare disease there. Um, chiropractor, your pelvis is twisted. You're out of alignment. You've got leg length discrepancies. They're telling you to buy orthotics. Do this, do that. Sleeping this way, sleeping that way. We're all guilty of it. And no wonder you have doubt and worry. Other people are planting things in your brain. They're telling you what to do, not helping you understand why you're doing it or how to go about doing it. Instead, they're seeding your mind with thoughts of, I'm broken. 
And of course, you're going to start to have more worry and doubt about those things. You're going to get emotionally involved in those thoughts, subconscious mind, fear, emotional mind, disease, then the mind creates disease within the body. You continue to hurt. So the question becomes, how long do you want to keep going down that path? And so what I did, what I committed my life to doing and my career to doing, saying, you know what? I realized that probably not any one of these people has a solution, but they all have little nuggets that I could pick up and learn along the way. If life is learning, I'm never going to be done learning how to solve this problem. All right. So I'm going to learn from all these people the best that I can, knowing that I'm never going to stop. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all that knowledge, be able to look at this approach and take an angle of observation and approach to solving these back butt sciatica problems from the view of a chiropractor, from the view of a PT and all the different McGill's, McKenzie's, and all these different approaches, right? Study myofascial release and trigger point therapy and understand kind of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and do all these things. Work with hip and spine surgeons. Take the best available research. Read, study, constant study. Then put in the reps. So this year alone, 1,300, 1,532, 1,695. I can't remember. That number just went out of my head. All right. That's going to bug me. I can't remember that number. Okay. But either way, in total, all right, over 10,000 people just put in the reps, knowing that I'm going to screw up along the way and it's ne maybe never going to be perfect. But how can I understand and learn the best of both the body and the mind to help people like you leave no stone unturned and give you the best chance of solving this problem? Right. And that's why I'm passionate about doing this. I took all that, boiled it down, put it inside my brain, and then I packaged it up for people like you. I created a process. Right? You've got to optimize things first. Then you've got to learn to measure. You've got to have a ruler. Right? Then you've got to systematically use mind and movement and all the strategies involved with that as medicine. Not a million things at one time, one thing. All right? Then teach you long-term strategy uh, such that you can prevent this with as much certainty in the future. All right. Again, I box this up. I created a program called the Glute Relief Accelerator Program. Again, thousands of people have been through this program and the results are just awesome. I love doing this stuff. Okay. Um, and we give it away to people like you. I'm essentially giving you mind, mind, right? Not my hands, my mind, the knowledge and experience and the process to solve this. Okay. So the idea is this, like you give a man a fish and you, and you feed him for a day. You teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Which do you prefer? I used to do lots of neck cracking and back cracking and all that stuff. And I was good. Somebody would be like, hey, man, you're awesome. Come back to me next week and the week after and the week after. I mean, for how many years do you want to see somebody for this problem? For the same problem, by the way. When I shifted from fixing people to teaching people, the results became much longer lasting. Right? Cool thing, even if it does pop up in the future, at the end of the day, you know what to do to solve it. Okay, so in summary, those are the nine lessons after reviewing however many cases in 2023, because I still can't remember. Um, and these are the nine lessons that I took away, right, as a specialist who continues to sharpen his ax over and over again, um, put in the reps to scientifically uh, try to learn how to better help people like you in pain. Okay, so mind over body, right? You've got, you've got to realize that the body is the instrument of the mind. If you just look at treating the body, you're probably missing half or more of the equation. Safety first. Lots of people think that the reason treatment works, right, is because it's fixing something structurally, but it could be because you believe it'll work, right? Uh, and or it creates safety in the system, meaning mentally or physically, it allows you to move more freely or break down some of those beliefs and those threats that were keeping you from getting better. Self-assessment better than someone else. You are in control, in control of the two things which created your pain experience, mind and body. Therefore, you're probably best to get yourself out of it. You can't manage what you don't measure. If you don't have a yardstick, hard to tell how much snow, all right? And so at the end of the day, um, you've got to systematically, uh, you've got to come up with a process to uh, you know, measure what's going well, what's not going well, and make decisions based off that data instead of just the emotion of it. Environment is more important than the exercise. Again, you can't exercise a bad diet. Education versus intelligent. You're going to meet a lot of smart people who have a lot of cool degrees, right? But if they don't specialize and they haven't followed a systematic process up to this point, and they're changing the way that they approach all these problems, and they haven't narrowed down the way that they think in a way that gives you what you need to do to solve the problem, and instead they're just fixing you, chances are they might be super smart, but not highly intelligent, right? And not very adaptable, okay? Trust the process. Again, everybody wants to be pain-free, but not everybody wants to go through a process to get there. All right. 
But if you go through the process and the results naturally follow, in my experience, okay, beliefs, you've got to break them, especially if they're not serving you. Okay, Beliefs inform your actions, which inform your results in life. All right. And then fear versus faith. They both take equal amounts of energy, equal amounts of breath, just for me to spit that out. They both demand that you believe in something you cannot see um, and in the future, uh, by the way. All right. So which do you choose? It's your choice. All right. So that is all I got. Hopefully, this was an interesting summary for you. I appreciate anybody who's checked out my channel, all of my followers. If you have some type of back butt or side of problem, um, one thing I would love to offer you is to review your case. Basically, um, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're from. We work with people all around the world. Maybe we can help you. Maybe we can't help you. But um, what I would ask is that if you're trying to um, approach solving this differently, you want to solve it naturally, and you're interested in learning what you need to do to resolve uh, your pain without pill shot surgery, and you definitely don't want to have to rely on someone else to fix you, uh, then click the link again, somewhere probably pinned in the comments or the description um, and submit details of your specific case and basically set up a time to chat with us. All right. So basically what's going to happen, you set up a time to chat, then you will be taken to uh, review what we call a pre-call packet. All right. And then after that, uh, or within that, there's going to be instructions to submit a case review. Basically, a questionnaire it gives me all the details that I need to confirm whether or not we can help. Um, if I review the case and I don't feel 100% confident I can help, we'll just tell you that. Uh, if we do feel confident we can help, then we can talk about what that process looks like. Okay, so that is all I got. Again, this is Dr. Charlie. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts below in the comments. Be sure to subscribe uh, for more like videos. And if you'd like me to review your case personally, again, we work with people all around the world and you're looking for a different approach where you're empowered and you're in control, uh, then go ahead and click the link below uh, in the comments or the description to apply to work with us. Thanks so much. Chat soon.